Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. This is a speaker meeting, and we have two speakers. Angelo is going to be our 10-minute speaker, and then we're going to turn our meeting over to our main speaker, and they will both share our experience, strength, and hope with us. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm an alcoholic and an addict, and my name is Angelo. Angelo. Um, I'll get some administrative stuff out of the way first. Uh, my sobriety date is August uh, 2nd, 2013. It's not my first sobriety date. I went to... Uh, What's that meeting called? I went to High Noon in San Francisco drunk for about three months, and uh, I thought I hallucinated that cat Lord at that meeting, <laughs> and I went back and got my six-month chip at that, you know, later, and I told him about that, and he was like, oh, yeah, I've heard that before. <laughs> um, so I was born uh, to a heroin-addicted prostitute and her pimp. Um, this was not a... Uh, sex positive uh situation this was a uh situation of slavery and a, and just oppression and um my mom now has 30 years sober in this program my dad died this past summer with 25 years sober in this program and uh i love them both dearly uh my dad and i had many many problems we uh solved them physically uh more than once uh while I was drinking and while I was sober. And uh, he, he loved me in his own way. He just wasn't um, really capable of being around when I was a kid due to his own uh, problems and issues. Uh, I grew up with my mom. It was, it was a really loving situation. She did her best to provide for us. Uh, we were broke, you know, uh, like, like broke, like... When I was about 12 years old, I figured out that, like, peanut butter in a tortilla, is, is, that's not dessert, you know? Like, that, that's how broke. <laughs> but there was always love, you know? We didn't really get that there was, like, more to be had out there because there was so much greatness, great amount of love in my house that wouldn't have been there if uh, this program wasn't around for my mom. And uh, this program saved my life before I ever even took a drink because of that. Um, when I was uh, four years old, I was in a uh, daycare and... Uh, this was a, uh, there wasn't many regulations on daycares in these days, I don't think. And um, the, the uh, 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 what is it called? Daycare mother, whatever the fuck it is, was, uh, <laughs> oh, there's like, I shouldn't cuss because who cares. And, uh, <laughs> and like, so she had this roommate named Michael, and Michael took it upon himself to uh, rape me um, a couple times a week over the course of three months. And, um... I don't tell you this because I'm trying to get sympathy or to be a victim. I tell you this because it's who I am. There's no excuse at all for any of the heinous, heinous things that I've done, both drinking and sober. None. And um, it doesn't matter if someone decided to fucking stick their dick up my ass when I was a little kid. That does not excuse anything that I've done at all. Um, so after this happened, my uh, father, who was a... Uh, uh, member of a notorious motorcycle club that you're not supposed to say the name of, like a Harry Potter kind of a thing. And um, him and a couple of his coworkers took uh, Michael for a ride, and uh, they killed him. And um, so with that, I figured out that uh, at about four years old, that A, you never, ever, ever, ever talk to the cops, and B, um, this was, it's over. I don't have to deal with this anymore. It's gone. The problem solved, and I can move on and have my life. But what started happening then is I started not talking about anything with anybody, you know? My dad would show up, I'd go to his house, like, oh, where was that boat you had two months ago? Oh, fuck the boat, don't worry about the boat, because the boat was stolen and the boat got impounded. And um, those kind of situations were what I grew up with, bikers and hookers. That's my family. And it's uh, not to say that it's wrong. I I'm not going to make that judgment call. But it uh, took me to a place where... Uh, I was completely uh, uh, loveless. I didn't love anything for the entirety of my drinking, I don't think. I didn't learn how to love at all until I got into these rooms, and you guys taught me that. Um, 
Let's see. Let's tell a story. Okay. Uh, so towards the end of my drinking, I had this pretty uh, big issue with police officers. Um, and SFPD, they're actually like pretty nice compared to most of the Bay Area, in my opinion. Um, and anyways, I walked out of this bar called The Outsider in the Tenderloin at about four in the morning. Four in the morning, not two in the morning. And because uh, this place, they just like close the doors and you can like keep going. And I think they have some kind of deal because there was cops right there. They didn't fucking bust the place. So it was like they busted me. And uh, I came out of this place and I decided to tell this cop who was very obese that um, him being obese was the re- like someone was going to die because of that. Like he wasn't going to save somebody because he was so fucking fat that like that he wouldn't be. A- and that's, this guy didn't really like that. Right. So he, uh, <laughs> him and a couple of the uh, other police officers that were with him. This is like four in the morning. Thank you. And um Five minutes, four in the morning, and the drunk tank's full, right? So they take this opportunity to take me around the corner and beat the shit out of me. And uh, I, you know, I probably deserved it in, on some level. No one deserves violence at all, of course. But, like, I uh, I walked right into this, uh, you know, begging to get hit in the mouth. And I did. I got hit in the mouth quite a few times. Um, I was extremely violent in my drinking with people. I got in a lot of bar fights. I lost a lot of bar fights. And it was nothing but self-harm. Uh, disguised as male bravado and uh, this need to be tough. And that's just complete fucking bullshit. It's utter nonsense. Um, when I came into these rooms, you guys taught me how to cry. And that, it's, it's, it's a saying I've heard only once and I really love it. It's like, I'd rather cry than die, you know? Because I need to feel my feelings. And I feel them deeper now that I'm sober. I was just talking about this with Brendan. And it's like... I feel love deeper now than I did before, if I felt it at all. I feel my trauma being triggered deeper now than I did before. And I get to use those things to, and the tools of this program to live a life of kindness. And that's what I try to do. It doesn't, it, you know, I get, um, I've been dealing with a situation very recently that's gotten extremely abusive, and I've just been trying to be kind this entire time. And it's really, really fucking hard. It's almost impossible, but I've done it up until 8.13 today. And it's, it's so far it's working because I haven't picked anything up. I want to, I want to drink today, but it doesn't matter what I want. What matters is that I come here and that I talk to you guys. You know, we come here and we get, and there's just fucking miracles in these rooms every day. And that's my higher power. My higher power is seeing people come in these rooms and get their lives back. You know, they get their freaking kids back. There's people that come in these rooms and they learn how to fucking read. Like, what? And I just, like, hit cops. You know what I mean? Like, it's not, like, my shit is nothing compared to, like, the amount of, the insane shit that other people go through. And they stay sober. Um, If you didn't hear anything from me tonight that you, that helped you, please go to another meeting. Please find somebody here to talk to. There's a lot of beautiful people here that will help you out. Brendan, Tinica, Ajax, me, Anything like there's there's a lot of love here. Thank you guys. Okay. And then now we have our main speaker, Vanessa. I'm gonna stay seated because I'm really tired. <laughs> um, I'm Vanessa, I'm an alcoholic. Vanessa. Uh, thank you so much for your share. Um so I I grew up feeling like I was really fucked up and it, it never made sense to me. I had a really privileged upbringing, parents that loved me. They listened to me. There was no abuse. There was nothing that happened, but I refused to hang out with people in my gated community. I wanted to hang out with homeless kids. I wanted to be around people that I thought looked like how I felt inside. And after years of sobriety, I still don't know why that was. I don't know if there is an answer and I don't know that that answer matters, but I know that I felt broken from the beginning. I mean, from like, I remember writing suicide notes when I was six and giving them to my mom. Now that I'm a mother, I can't imagine how terrifying (laughs) that is. But for whatever reason, that's how I was. And throughout high school, it, it was the same. I just felt like I didn't belong. And I went to a fantastic school. 
um, where the kind of liberal arts school that, you know, they cater to your specific learning disability if you had one or, you know, hold your hand through taking tests. Like it was just, but I still felt like I didn't deserve that kind of attention, that there was something wrong with me. Um, but I didn't start drinking. I started smoking pot and ditching school and having sex with boys that were older than me. And eventually I, I had, I think what happened was I ditched school and I came home and I didn't think anyone was home. And I had a horse, we had horses and we had a big house with a big barn and my horse was in the back and I got on my horse and I rode to the one person's house. Now imagine this neighborhood is very exclusive, right? There's, it's like, there's not the bad folks aren't there. Supposedly I find the one kid that had been in juvie, who'd been sent away to Idaho on a wilderness expedition, who was like 18 and had a kid already. I find him and decide he and I are going to have sex. And I tie my horse up in the back of his house and trot myself in there. And the next thing I know, my dad's knocking on the door. My dad was the mayor, which I left out. I still don't know how he knew my horse was tied up back there, but he did. And I remember, like, and this was super uncomfortable. Like, I was sweaty, you know, throwing clothes on and trying to act like nothing was going on. And he hauled my ass to rehab that that day. Um, and they didn't know what to do with me because I wasn't, I wasn't using... I wasn't drinking and I smoked a little pot and didn't like it. So they just had me in this holding pen with a bunch of kids that were super messed up. And I remember hearing them screaming and being put in the padded room. And I was thinking, wait, this isn't my life. I don't belong here. So that was when I was first introduced to the 12 steps because everybody in this program of mentally disturbed youth had to go through the 12 steps, but it was like a really expeditious process with workbooks. And I, I killed it. I did a great job because <laughs> I was like, I'll do this, you know, and, and I was pretty sure I convinced everybody I didn't belong there. So the, the short version is I was supposed to be released from said facility. And the plan was that I was going to go on a wilderness trip in Montana and then be returned home after having some kind of spiritual awakening and, and becoming a good, good kid. And the last night I got caught with the guy across the hall hiding in my bed. And so they sent me away and I never came home. And I went out into the woods. It was a three-week trip in the winter. And it was that kind of like brutal, like, I don't even know how, like I was cold the whole time. You're just hiking all day for no reason. They don't tell you what time it is. They don't tell you where you're going or why you're doing it. And I kept trying to run away, so they eventually took my shoes every night because you can't run away in the dead of winter in Montana. So I I come I do this trip and then I I'm not allowed in the in the big house where all the other people live. I have to earn my way into the house. So I lived in a tent outside of this big house and I ran away. And I ran away to Spokane and got on us. I conned some sweet old couple to give, to give me a, a hundred bucks to get on a, on a bus. And I called my, some guy I was dating and I was like, you gotta pick me up. I'm on, I'm on the run. And my mom showed up, like he'd called my parents. And so that was the beginning. After that, things, things were okay. Like I, I ended up living in this place, doing my senior year of high school there. Didn't get into trouble. And I thought, everyone kind of thought that I was cured. And then I went to college. And that's when I started drinking. Because it was the first time nobody was watching me. I could stay out all night. Nobody knew. I could drink. I could do drugs. I could have sex with whoever I wanted. And I don't think I went to a class ever. And that lasted. I was able to, to keep it going for like, a semester until my parents figured it out. Cause you, you get non-completes on all your, like, you don't even get F's. You just get like, she never showed up once to biology. Like that doesn't count. <laughs> so I, I went home and, uh, they decided, you know, it might be best for me to live in like a halfway kind of house and go to school. So those folks in Montana that I had lived with, they had a house in Missoula, Montana, and you could live there and go to college. 
So I did that and it was great for a semester. I did everything I was supposed to do. And then I was at a study group and there was this guy that I liked and we were studying and he offered me orange juice and vodka. And from that moment on, it was done. Like, I mean, I just, I was done. I never, I, I went to class, but I didn't really go to all my classes. It was just downhill. It was the whole cycle started over again. And I had, I was living in this group home and one of the girls was my best friend. She and I had gone through that initial wilderness trip I told you about together. And we were both in this home together. And she was trying to reach out to me and I was too busy going to bars and I was super excited about that because I was underage. So I thought it was really special that I could get in. And she ended up killing herself is, is how that ended up. And it destroyed me. And I had the thought, you know, had I not been fucking around, excuse me for saying that, um, I could have been there for her and it changed my life. It was a, a 180. I went home. Uh, I got a job. I just gave up on school and I worked my butt off. And then I would have like two or three jobs and I was still living at home. And I was, I was just, I wasn't drinking. I wasn't doing drugs. I was just focused on, on myself and, and getting stuff together and being a good person. And that lasted almost a year. And then the girls at work started going out after work and, and drinking wine. And so it didn't get as bad this time. It was manageable. I was okay. And from then on, my life would look okay. I would just drink enough to, looking back now, I mean, I drink every night. I just didn't get wasted. But it wasn't like I couldn't go at night without drinking. And um, odd as it is, I kept getting promoted and doing really well at work. And I was in San Francisco because I lived in Southern California. And I was on a business trip. <laughs> and I was uh, feeling really good about myself because it was the first time anyone had ever sent me on a business trip. And it was like, oh, my God, these people are going to trust me and they're going to fly me someplace new and I'm going to be in charge. It was a big deal. And I just didn't want to screw it up. I missed my plane on the way back because I was drinking with some older man I had no business being with. And when I got on the plane, finally, to get back to Southern California, I met this guy who would become my boyfriend and he had 12 years sober at the time. And so because of that, I just didn't drink. I was very, uh, easily influenced, you know? So if you drank, I would drink with you. If you didn't drink, I wouldn't drink with you. And so I didn't drink for a, a long time, like three years. And I, looking back, I was freaking out of my mind crazy, <laughs> but at the time it was like, I had it all together. Um, so to speed that up, my life started to look differently. You know, it was, then I got a career and everything was going great. Like I kept getting promoted. I finally wasn't living paycheck to paycheck. Um, I, I moved out of their house, out of my parents' house. I was independent and I got this great job and then I got a DUI and it wasn't because I was wasted. It was a checkpoint after drinks with coworkers in Berkeley. And I remember getting arrested and thinking, this is not my fucking life. Like, how did this happen? And the cop was like, because it looked to me like it was construction. You know, there was just a bunch of lights. I didn't know what was going on. And he said, yeah, we don't get the smart ones. Oh. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> and then I ended up sleeping in a jail cell for the night. Mm. And I had to go to those AA classes. And and by the way, by this time, that boyfriend that was sober was way out of the picture. So that's why it was a, it was a free for all. But anyway, that didn't get me to stop drinking. What happened was I was so depressed and so miserable eventually. And I realized it didn't matter how much money I could make or how successful I thought I was or how many friends I thought I had. I was miserable. I was miserable all the time. I felt so lonely. My world was so small. All I did was work and come home and drink. And my idea of feeling satisfied and good was 
a Friday night looking around, knowing that the drug dealer had dropped off whatever he was going to drop off, because by that point I had enough money to get them to deliver, and it would be pot and ecstasy and coke and whatever else. He was like, you should try this. And enough alcohol to sustain me all weekend. And that was like the feeling of completeness of like, I'm not going to have to leave the house at all, all weekend. I'm set. And at some point I, it became so, I was like, this can't be it. You know, this can't be my whole life is this. I'm not happy. There's no joy. And I remembered that guy that I dated with the 12 years, he was happy and his friends were happy and he would cart me around to meetings once in a while and, and to conventions like Akipa. And I had that, that would just, it just took one thought where I was like, you know, I know where there's happy people. I'm going to go to a meeting. And I did not go because I thought I was an alcoholic. I didn't go because I had a drinking problem. I went because I was miserable and I thought you guys were happy. And I, I had the idea that, you know what? If I have to pretend to be an alcoholic to fit in and be happy like you guys, then I would do that. You know, if I have to say I'm an alcoholic, <laughs> fine. But I'm not really one. And I truly believe that. It was like, you know, drinking is not the problem. It's this inner sickness in me. And then, of course, I got a sponsor and I started working the steps and I started, I used to raise my hand in meetings. I only went to women's meetings because by that point I knew that like I was just a predator when it came to men and I needed to stay away or it would never work. So for the first few months, I only went to women's meetings and I would raise my hand and say, I'm new. I'm not going to call you. I'm scared. Can you come take my number? And women did, and they called me. And to this day, I tell sponsees that. Like, you know that whole, because I had some, I remember hearing somebody speak, and they made it sound like it was, you have to want it enough. It's your responsibility to reach out. Well, fuck that. I was scared shitless. I needed women to come to me and help me. And they did. And it was amazing. And all of a sudden, I had friends when I had no friends. I had things to do on the weekend. I had things to do at night. I would... I got fired, by the way, right before I got sober from my amazing job at Google, which I always tell this story. I think it wasn't my fault. Had nothing to do with the bullet of cocaine that fell out of my pocket during a staff meeting. I still was like, nobody saw that. So it couldn't have been it. But so the blessing was that I had shit to do. I was unemployed. All I did was go to meetings. And I look back at that now. I'm like, what a gift. The gift of desperation and the gift of time and just being able to spend a few months. That's all I did. And as I went through the steps, it was like I started to develop the muscle of being able to do stuff even though I didn't feel like it. Because before, it would be like, I can't make plans with you in three days because God knows how I'm going to feel in three days. Like, I can't make that kind of commitment. <clears throat> or, you know, I don't feel like getting out of bed, so I'm not going to. And that started to change. It was like, oh, you know what? I'm going to show up. I don't feel like it right now. But feelings aren't facts, and they don't need to dictate my life. And I'm going to show up anyway. And if I still hate it, then I can back off. And that, that, just that ability alone changed everything for me. I had, it's amazing when I look back, like how much my feelings dictated everything. Well, let me tell you, my feelings, like they come out of left field. I can't be dictated by my feelings. And I realized that, uh, when I was drinking, that's all I was. I was always, I was always reacting. There was no ability to respond. It was only until I started meditating that I got the ability to pause and then make decisions from that place rather than decisions out of fear or angst or rage. It was like I had this ability now to pause and respond to things. And then my life started getting bigger. You know how I described it? It was like my life was really small. It kind of felt like I was in this prison and I couldn't even see opportunities outside of it. I couldn't see other ways of doing things. That all changed. All of a sudden, those walls just disappeared. And it was like there was just opportunity everywhere. Opportunity for friendships with people I never would have thought I would have hung out with. Opportunities for different jobs, different relationships. All of a sudden, there was just choice. 
But then with that came the ability to have, or I, I, I had to learn how to make decisions. And I remember my second sponsor asked me to write about when had I ever made a decision. And that goes back to I really hadn't. I had just been reacting to everything. Then I got to respond. And then eventually I got to decide. And that was the moment of like, okay, I'm going to decide what I'm going to do with my life. I'm going to decide where I'm going to focus my energy. And it was so empowering. And that that only happened because I was sober. And not just because I was sober, but because I was working a spiritual program. That was the key thing. So speeding up now, now I have seven years in a week or something. And, you know, I came, I I went from unemployed, (coughs) single, now I have a baby, I'm a partner at a a headhunting firm, I live in Alameda, (laughs) like, it's (laughs) with a picket fence, It's really outrageous. And I look around and I'm like, how, I don't even understand. Like, I didn't, I didn't dream any of this up. I, I'd given up on the fact that I could ever be a relationship or that I would ever have kids or that I'd ever have a career that people thought I was valuable in or that I could add something to. And I have all that, but now I face another problem. I no longer have the gift of time. I I don't have the gift of energy. I'm tired all the time. And that means I don't have that enthusiasm to go to a meeting every other day like I used to. And that was unexpected. Like when I had a newborn and I I look back and when when I was tired before I had a child and I was like, that's cute. Like and when people tell me they're tired and they don't have a child, I'm like, oh, fuck yourself because you have no idea. I have never experienced that kind of exhaustion and I didn't go to a meeting for months and I got psycho like, and it's insidious because I I didn't think I was crazy. I thought I was seeing everything clearly, but all it takes is to go to one meeting. And for whatever reason, I come out of that meeting and all of a sudden I see things just a little bit differently. And then I go, wait a minute, have I been insane this whole time? (laughs) And I didn't know it. And that's exactly what happens every time I don't go to meetings regularly. It's like that. I I suddenly lose the ability to respond and I start to react and then I lose perspective and my life starts to feel like I'm in that box again and I stop seeing opportunity. And if you try to help me, I will just tell you no and how you don't understand what I, what's going on with me. And that all, and I can't explain it. I don't know why meetings work like that for me. It's not enough just to meet with my sponsee or my sponsor. I have to get to meetings. And this is a whole new problem. I never thought my life was going to be so big that I would have this kind of struggle. And I used to hear people talk about it and I didn't really get it. And now I know that in my sobriety, there's like these tears. Like I go through different phases. My program looks different. My, the onion, the layer of the onions get peeled off and I'm like, wow, that's really crappy of you. That's a whole new level of defect that I didn't even know was there. Or, I mean, there's just so many things. How am I doing on time? Shut up. (laughs) (laughs) Um, well then I'll just take my time. Let me tell you some more about the magic of sobriety. Um, I, So I have this job and when I don't go to meetings, I'm pretty sure that I'm going to get fired all the time. (laughs) And I know that when, when I'm not working my program, I start, it's like, I become really small. I become less valuable. I stop taking up space. I start to apologize a lot for everything And what I understand now is I need to notice when those things are happening because those are the clues that I need to work my program harder. It's like a little roadmap I have to follow. It's kind of like that feeling of understanding right before, you know, that you're, you're going to be hungry and you anticipate that you're going to have to think about when you're going to eat rather than being starving and then just start shoveling food in your face. 
that's kind of how I feel about my program is like, I have to be acutely aware of what's starting to come up in me and how, how I'm going to deal with that, how I'm going to work my program better. I have today, um, I'm in this, let me just tell you about today. So today my dog has cancer and we just found out that it's spread to the bones and they said euthanasia or do radiation therapy. So she's getting radiation therapy. She's all fucked up. My dishwasher, after I just loaded it full of dishes, broke. One of my cars died. And I'm thinking about this. I'm like, wow, I, I have money saved. I can pay for, for my dog's radiation. I have two cars. <laughs> so one dying isn't a big deal. I can wash the dishes by hand. And I, I had this thought today. I was like, wow, those are great problems to have. That's so much better than the problems I used to have. Like there's an, uh, I'm going to sniff the carpet for the ecstasy pill I dropped or scrounging enough weed or, you know, just my life looks so different. And I, I try to remind myself of that every day. And I get the ability to remind myself because I have two brothers that are addicts. And, um, they're much older than me. I'm, I'm the youngest of, there's three of them, a sister and two brothers. And my brothers, one is 52 and one is 48 and they're both addicts and they can't pay their rent. And one of them has a daughter and they're just all around screw ups. I mean, they just, they can't get a job. They're always, so anyway, I've paid both of their rents a couple times and I'm going to tell you why, because I think it's important. Everyone, you know, my, my parents said, you're enabling them, you're blah, blah, blah. I made a deal with them that they were going to go to meetings and they call me each one every day and tell me about the meeting that they went to. I mean, sure, they could be elaborate liars, but I mean, they, they get pretty detailed into what they hear, if they share it or not. And I'm not trying to be their sponsor, but I made a deal. It's like, okay, I'm going to bail you out right now. And I want you to talk to me about the meetings. So each one is a little slightly different time, but they're both roughly like 20 days in. And what I hear from them is amazing. Like these guys are so, like, they're such victims of life. And all of a sudden there's just this glimmer that's changing. Every phone call is a little bit different and I'm scared to be hopeful. Hmm. I don't even know if it matters, but what I know is I, I'm getting this gift. Like it was worth to pay their rent just for me to see in somebody else. It just took a few days and it's like they're each one of them. It's like a whole new world has opened up. And I thought that must've been me. That must've been all of us. Like just that shift in perspective. I get to see it happening in them. It transforms my relationship. I mean, my, I've been talking to each one of them now and it's like, I enjoy talking to them. Whereas before either one would call and I was like, Oh Jesus, like I can't, I don't have the emotional bandwidth to deal with this right now. It's mind blowing. And then I'm reminded of what it must've been like to deal with me. What, what I must've been like before I was sober. I mean, this is transformative on so many levels. Even if you're not aware of it, I guarantee you that your relationships have been transformed as you, as you've gotten sober and it may not be your experience even, but it will be everybody else's experience around you for sure. So I get the gift of seeing that in my, in my brothers. I do want to, since I have all this time, I do want to touch on something briefly, which is being sober in the workplace. Cause I think that that comes up a lot and I'm in a career where everyone goes out and drinks together and how I dealt with that when I first got sober um, was that I didn't go for a while. And then, well, because I was unemployed when I first got sober, but even early, early <laughs> on when I actually got a job, I just wouldn't go. And then eventually I had to deal with why aren't you drinking? And I hear that come up in meetings a lot with people talk about how uncomfortable they are when there's alcohol around. I have found that 
I have become, everyone now at my workplace knows that I don't drink. At some point, each one of them pushed it. I heard things like, oh, come on, we're all, we're all drinking. You got to be a part of it. Or, you know, why aren't you drinking? You want to diet or what? And I mean, it would just go on and on or they'd push it. You know, they'd really want to know why. And there were a couple times early on where I was like, cause I'm a fucking alcoholic. <laughs> My sponsor told me that was not the appropriate response. <laughs> and so I stopped doing that. And instead I said, you know, I don't drink. I haven't, I haven't, I've, I haven't had a drink in years. And they usually, like, it dawns on them, you know, they figured out, like, oh, years. This isn't just, like, a today thing. She she actually doesn't drink. And I have found tricks. It, You know, I go to a lot of events, and I always have, like, a club soda and a lime. I have no problem faking that I'm drinking is what it comes down to. And that's worked for me. Faking it in the sense that it, I'm holding something – that is questionable whether it's alcohol or not. And so it usually deters people from asking me or trying to give me something to drink. I have had the experience, and this happened, this was a moment where I knew I was transformed forever. There was two moments. The first was it was like we were sitting at a table and the drinks got confused. And I took a drink and I felt, it didn't go down my throat, I felt it in my mouth and I spit it out on the table in front of all these people. And I immediately acted like I was caught, like I choked. (laughs) And that was the moment I was like, this isn't me. Vanessa would never have spit out, would have spit in front of another person, A, let alone spit out alcohol. That never would have happened. That was like a God moment. My other... uh, So anyway, so that's the workplace scenario. I have dealt with it and I think we all can. You just can't be ashamed or I found like I just own it. No, I don't drink. I mean, I haven't had a drink in forever and that, that shuts people up. I was reminded, I'm so sorry if this is scattered, you guys, but I'm just going to go with it. Um, my other God moment besides when I spit out the alcohol in front of everybody was I had had a medical procedure and they gave me pain pills and I love pain pills. I mean, that was like, I knew when they gave them to me, I was like, this is super dangerous. And I had maybe two and a half years and I was like, whoa, this is, this is like, this could be it. This could be it. And so I, I had these pills and I took them as prescribed for one day. I had enough for seven days. And at the end of that first day, I was like, you know what? I could deal with this. And I took the pills and I flushed them down the toilet. Can I just tell you, I'm the type of person, like, I would save them and give them to somebody who needed them. You know, I would have been like, I'm not going to be able to enjoy these. Do you want them? You can have them. Like, when I stopped drinking, I gave my alcohol away to people that were alcoholics in my neighborhood. (laughs) You know, like, I would never throw pills away. That's insane. Even saying it to you sounds insane. But that was God doing for me what I, I would never have done for myself. I mean, I still look at that like, whoa, that was... That was what being sober is all about. That's the result of working a program. That was, that was not me. That was God. And that reminds me, and then I'm going to wrap up, is that my relationship with a power greater than myself, it's hard today. I forget. Tony Robbins <laughs> once said <laughs> that if you view God as like, I, I'm, I'm not really quoting, but it was something to the effect of, Like if you're on BART and you're bouncing around and you reach up and you grab the bar, that's God. Like all you have to do is reach up. And I use that in my head a lot. Like, okay, what's going on? Just reach up. Just, you know, just remember that you're, you're not the all powerful in this. And that really helps me because I forget all the time. And it's like, I have to say that to myself grab on, grab on, hold on to this power that's greater than you. You don't have to be in this all alone. Invite that power, whether you call it God or a chair or a tree or whatever that's not you, invite it into whatever is happening now. To this day, I write notes and put them in a God box. I have a God box at work. I have a God box everywhere. I have a God box in the car. I have a God box in my bedroom. I have a God box in the kitchen. I've got a God 
there can't be 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm going to tell you about God and then it's going to be over. <laughs> I've got a God box everywhere. Why? Because I have to call, like, I'm a writer, so I'll write a note. I'm like, God, I'm going to kill this guy that's sitting next to me. I need you to come into this situation and then I'll write the serenity prayer out. But it's like this exercise of inviting a power greater than myself into whatever situation is happening. That has been a huge gift. And when somebody first told me to get a God box, I was like, really? Seriously? Like, I'm not going to sit here and write love letters to, uh, you know, my higher power. And as it turns out, as I said, I have a God box everywhere. In fact, my sponsees have all made me God boxes because they know that I like to have God boxes everywhere. I can't tell you how powerful it is to invite something into you, into your, into your thinking, because that's what it is for me. And I've done that my whole sobriety. I think that's probably all the bits of wisdom that I have. After the baby, one more thing, if for those women that have children, I wished I had heard a lot of moms talking because it was the hardest, it's been the hardest time of my life because my body is different, my thinking's different, my boobs are different, my priorities are different. And I didn't know how to deal with that. And I realize now that that's why my sobriety has to be nimble. My spiritual program has to be able to evolve. It's not going to look the way that it looked before. It's got to look different and I have to be flexible and that has to be okay. And I've seen that happen with other people where their life, their circumstances have changed. And if, for me, if I hold on to it has to look this way, this is what worked last time that, that doesn't jive. Like I need to be flexible and nimble. And so that's what I'm trying to do, but it's been hard, but I haven't had a drink or use drugs once. The only time I had any drugs was when I was giving birth and I didn't even want them. I was trying to do it at home. It didn't work out, but you know, I had them stop the drugs early. Do you know why? Because I wanted to feel it. I wanted to feel my experience. That's what's different about me today. I don't want to buffer. I want life straight up, whether it's hard, whether it's good, whether I'm angry or sad. I just want life. I never wanted life before. I wanted a buffer, something in between me and the experience so I felt like I could control how much of the experience I wanted to get. I don't want that anymore. That's a miracle. That's what's different. I wanted to feel what it was like to have a baby. I wanted to feel what it was like to go to Burning Man sober. I wanted to feel what it was like to do everything. That's so new. That's And that's a gift. And that's all I've got. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.